Today is March 19th, 2025. West Hartford Community Interactive is thrilled to bring you an interview with astronaut Johnny Kim. Johnny Kim joined the U.S. Navy SEALs directly out of high school and became a Navy corpsman and sniper. While on active duty, he completed a mathematics degree at the University of San Diego and then later got his Doctor of Medicine degree from the Harvard Medical School. While he was completing his internship, he was picked to be a NASA astronaut candidate. A native of Los Angeles, California, this is to be his first mission to space. Kim holds the rare dual designation of being both a naval aviator and a flight surgeon. Astronaut training for Kim included technical and operational instruction in International Space Station systems, including extravehicular activities or EVA operations, T-38 flight training, robotics, physiological training, expeditionary training, field geology, water and wilderness survival training, and Russian language training. Kim enjoys spending time with his wife and their three children, outdoor activities, strength training, video games, and lifelong learning activities. Uh, hi there, Dr. Kim. Uh, my name is James Dowling Healy with West Hartford Community Interactive. I just want to say it's a real treat to have you with us today. James, uh, please call me Johnny. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so we noticed from the uh, press release, they talked uh, that you're going to be doing some tech demos when you're up there in space. And my director, Jennifer Evans, is very excited about that. Are there any pieces of technology you're particularly interested in working with? All of the above. <laughs> uh, and I'll give you something more specific. Tech demo. You know, I think the human body is a tech demo. Um, but uh, oof, I can go ad nauseum about that. Uh, there's a lot of experiments that I'll be a part of that will help give NASA and our colleagues a lot of answers to how the human body responds to long duration spaceflight which is gonna be important if we're going to go do multi-year missions, especially to Mars and beyond. Uh, tech demos, you know, there is, there's a lot of furnaces on the space station. And one of the things that I will potentially be working with is a lot of material science and how alloys are created in microgravity. And so I'm not an expert on this, just having, uh, we'll be an operator for some of the machinery and help hopefully conduct some of the experiments. But these furnaces can, the, I think the idea of the experiment is to hopefully see if we can create new types of alloys with favorable properties and, and how microgravity might have a part in some of that manufacturing process. That sounds great. I'm a, uh, a big fan of when the spin-offs uh, portion of your office releases information about uh, new projects. Um, and it sounds like that's going to be applicable to the work you're doing up there as well. Um, do you have any personally favorite uh, spinoffs that you should uh, suggest people would look into? So I have, I think, I think the spinoffs that I'm super interested in are the ones that have real life benefits to people on Earth. I mean, to be clear, all of the spinoffs have some sort of benefit to bring back to planet Earth. I think the one that can kind of hit home for a lot of people that might be watching this is cancer research and cancer drugs. So for those watching, one of, well, really the only variable that has essentially changed in this national laboratory that we call the International Space Station is microgravity or just kind of the lack of gravity, right? Otherwise, the composition of the atmosphere, the molecules of air, the pressure, that's all meant to more or less mimic that on Earth. And so when we have that one variable, that's like the entire concept of what kind of science experiments can we learn about. Keytruda, which is a cancer treatment drug, was there was collaboration effort between pharmaceuticals on Earth and the space station to see how the absence of microgravity can affect protein crystallization. And so what you don't have with with the lack of gravity or microgravity is you don't have a lot of the buoyancy convection forces that drive some of the protein crystallization that happens on Earth. And so what astronauts were able to do was they were able to create um, essentially an enhanced protein crystallization of this drug that was able to increase safety and efficacy 
for patients. And then in turn, scientists on the ground were able to mimic manufacturing um, processes to, to kind of capture some of those benefits. And so that's just one of many different things astronauts have done that have had real world benefits back on home. I, I have to admit, when I was looking at the, the list, when I was preparing my questions, um, 2,000 plus items, that's amazing. And then there's the ones people are probably familiar with, like mylar and maybe artificial limbs and cochlear implants. And the one that got me is just a few hours ago, I was using a temper-based um, uh, pillow. So it's you know from the basic to the incredibly <laughs> important, uh, like uh, cancer medications and the like. Um, so I, my understanding is you're planning to be up in space for approximately eight months. Um, and I know that there's concerns about uh, bone loss and, and physiology changes uh, with long duration space flight, like you mentioned. Um, given your background as a doctor and SEAL and now astronaut, are there any particular exercises that um, you think are essential, both up in space and on Earth, that most people should do if they have the time? Squat. Like physical exercise, Squat, squatting, the deadlifts, any kind of compound movements that where you are acting against an axial load, which is what ARED does for us on the International Space Station. The ARED is the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, and it can produce up to 600 pounds of force that's attached to a barbell that then you can imagine you can do a myriad of exercises of compound movements. And so this resistance, this strength training provides a, um, a stimulus for our musculoskeletal system to ensure that we are not wasting away to atrophy and bone loss. And, uh, and a lot of those same things apply for down here on Earth. Fantastic. Um, we're, we're near the middle point of most semesters, and uh, I teach some STEM students. And I know many of them, uh, if there's any words of encouragement or suggestions for study skills, I'm sure they'd love to hear them from you, if you have any. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so much of schooling, uh, whether it's undergraduate or graduate, is, is, is not so much the material that you're learning, but how to learn. And so, you know, I've, I've changed my philosophy approaching school, and I think Ultimately, each person needs to find what works best for them. I do think a general approach that I kind of take when I'm, whenever I'm learning something new is just to kind of take a step back, see the forest from the trees, and, and come up with a really good question that I'm trying to find the answer to. And never skimping on the basics. The basics to me, whether that's in chemistry, or biology, or biochemistry, mathematics, they form the very foundation of all of the advanced concepts. And, and a common mistake is to kind of go into those advanced concepts without truly understanding the basics. Mm -hmm. Those, I think those are the things. And, uh, and of course, consistency. Um, oftentimes our brains are not really wired to just um, to cram uh, last minute. It just, our, we don't form neural synapses that well like that. That's, that's excellent advice, and I just want to say thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Good luck on your mission, and you're welcome back anytime. Uh, good luck, and thank you again, sir. Have a great day. Thanks, sir. You too. Bye now. I would like to thank NASA and NASA astronaut Johnny Kim for their time today. West Hartford Community Interactive, for the community, by the community, I'm James Dowling-Healy. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>